good good afternoon with several vaccine candidates reporting very encouraging results in late stage trials the destruction and disruption unleashed by the unprecedented pandemic of covid-19 seems to end soon hopefully what is the current status of the development of these vaccines when will i get the vaccine how much will it cost what is the preparedness of india in terms of manufacture distribution and delivery this session vaccine magic and reimagining healthcare in a post covid world will try to look at all these aspects we have very senior leaders today for this session representing indian government international healthcare system and industry who will be sharing their perspectives on the much awaited vaccines may i now invite dr sangeeta reddy president fiki to deliver her welcome address and introduce the distinguished panelists good afternoon and namaste at no time like the present has healthcare been as center stage at no time has everyone been so focused on healthcare as we have been now it has truly been an unprecedented time and the one thing that really came out to give us hope to give us a sense of comfort to treat to trace to test to find a way to give us that path forward was the magnitude and the greatness of the scientific community of doctors nurses healthcare workers pharmaceutical manufacturers device manufacturers i want to begin by thanking every single one who's worked over the last 10 months in a tireless and unimaginably passionate manner to make this transition we at fiki are tremendously privileged to be here today with this panel it encapsulates some of the finest minds some of the people who have driven the transformation and many of the people who are spearheading the hope of the future so i i want to take this time to really introduce acknowledge and gratefully thank our tremendous speakers um i'm going to begin with um, our second speaker uh, because dr vk paul is just joining but i'm going to begin with our second speaker uh, dr david pryor or actually lord david pryor uh, lord david pryor who is the chair of the nhs and is with us today and david we're exceptionally grateful to you for spending your time and being with us um, he is not just very familiar with india but someone who has been knighted for his healthcare contribution as the chair of nhs england and it falls upon his shoulders to take care of the health of the citizens of uk and he has done so tremendously well uh, david will walk us through some of the the challenges the road map and how he chose the path that he has moving on i'm also going to go ahead and introduce as i welcome our other esteemed panelists because i don't think any time in the last 10 months has anyone been able to get so many incredible people together dr habib khurakiwala past president fiki and chair of wokhat limited an industry stalwart dr habib khurakiwala has enriched uh, a pro his professional experience of five decades and with his mantra of vision to execute he successfully led wokhat to be a major indian pharmaceutical that holds a strong presence in the key global economies he will share with us what his manufacturing strategy is when his company is going to come out with the vaccine where he is manufacturing and what he thinks moving on someone again who's very special to fiki mr pankaj patel past president fiki chairman of kadila healthcare and under his visionary leadership sidus kadila has been at the forefront of making significant contributions in therapeutics vaccines and diagnostics Mr Patel has been nominated as a as a member of the mission steering group under the national health mission he is also a member of the drug technical advisory board formed by the ministry of health and family welfare government of india at every stage you will see pankaj bhai as he is very fondly referred to bring his knowledge with a practical sanguine nature and people know you can trust him to do what's good for the country uh moving on dr krishna ella um krishna thank you so much for being here we know how extremely 
busy you are and what a tremendous stage your company Bharat Biotech is in. Under Dr. Ella's leadership, Bharat Biotech has successfully developed Rotavac and developing the world's first vaccine against rotavirus introduced uh, for diarrheal infections and death. And un under his leadership, the company also developed and launched uh, TIPPA TCV, the world's first clinically approved and WHO pre-qualified typhoid conjugate vaccine. So with this great history, with this great background and history in the development of vaccine, his company is among the forerunners and has tied up with the Scientific Institute of India to bring a made in India vaccine to the country. We also have with us Mr. Gagandeep Singh, country president of AstraZeneca, and everyone knows AstraZeneca is at the forefront of delivering a vaccine to the world. And as the country president and managing director, he's responsible for driving AstraZeneca's science-led strategy and will give us insights once again into when the vaccine will be available, what's the delivery mechanism. So all this will be moderated by our very special uh, moderator, Ms. Tamanna. Uh, but we will now directly move into the special address by Lord David Pryor. We'd start with that and move into the address by Dr. V.K. Paul, after which we go into the panel. So may I, with uh, great happiness, welcome Lord David Pryor to share with us the journey that his tremendous country has been through and his view and his advice to all of us. Well, Sangeeta, it's a huge honor and privilege for me to be able to address your conference today. If you can't hear me at some point or can't see me, will you put up your hand or shout at me or something? And um, good. Um, and Sangeeta, I would just like to pay tribute to the uh, um, extraordinary work that you have done in sort of global healthcare, you and your company, Apollo Hospitals, um, a wonderful company and a company and a, a hospital group that we work with very closely in the NHS and, and the work you're doing on helping us with training new doctors and new nurses to come into the NHS is hugely appreciated by, by, by all of us. Well, it has been um, an extraordinary time to be the chairman of a big healthcare system like the NHS uh, over the last year. Um, over 60,000 people have died in the UK of coronavirus over that time. So it has been a truly traumatic time. And I have to be honest with you and say that it is not over yet. Uh, I think the next three months are going to be extremely difficult. Um, Many people are relaxing their guard. They're thinking the vaccine is coming, we can relax. But actually, January and February could be a very difficult time for, for the UK and actually for Western Europe and, of course, uh, United States um, as, as well. So our hopes are pinned on, on the vaccine. And I could, should just echo the, um, uh, the words that you used, Sangeet, that to say how much we recognize the importance of the scientists, the clinical trial trialists, and all the volunteers who were in those clinical trials. And the regulators, often the regulators get a pretty bad press, but actually the regulators, certainly in the UK, have been phenomenally agile um, and receptive this time. And big pharma and biotech, you know, it's not often you hear healthcare systems praising big pharma and biotech, but I, I'd like to say this on behalf of the NHS, that the the contribution that the pharmaceutical industry has made and the biotech industry has made in both in both vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics over the last 12 months has been truly extraordinary. So turning, if we can, to the vaccine, um, Sangeeta, to start with, it is just under a year that the, uh, the virus, the COVID-19 virus, was sequenced and distributed to scientists around the world. And here we are, less than a year later, uh, we have the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine uh, actually being used in UK, now the, approved in the US um, and in Europe. So for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, the AstraZeneca-Oxford one, and I should pay tribute to the Serum Institute of India as well for the contribution that they have made um, in vaccines over this period of time. We hope the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine will be uh, approved and will be used within a matter of days now. We're keeping our fingers crossed, but it's looking very positive. 
vaccine. And of course, Moderna have got that vaccine. Janssen are very close, GSK, Sanofi, and others as well. So this has been an extraordinary effort by the whole of, of the pharma industry. And they have developed over this time two new novel vaccine technologies, both mRNA and using viral vectors, um, both of which have come of age over this time. And the combination of these novel technologies with genomics, uh, proteomics, and data analytics does, I think, open up a huge new opportunity for vaccines. New hope for malaria, TB, and HIV AIDS. But actually, it is not fanciful to think that vaccine technologies could, su could support the development of effective therapeutics across a broader range of pathologies, including cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, who knows? This could be a, this, this pandemic, one of the, the silver linings of this pandemic could be to open up a whole new branch of pharmaceutical um, research and development. Um, in a way, I think the pandemic has shown mankind at its worst and its best. At its worst, clearly we are totally unprepared for a virus of this kind. You know, we have not invested in public health in the way that we should have done. In the UK, our diagnostics industry uh, at the beginning of this pandemic was woefully unprepared for a virus of this scale. But also at its best, you know, the, innova the innovation that has, has been triggered over the last 12 months has been truly extraordinary. I think Edward Janner, who is the great, who is the sort of founder of modern vaccinology in the West, um, who discovered the vaccine for smallpox in at the end of the at the end of the 18th century? I think would be due, would be hugely proud of what uh, scientists have done uh, this time round. I hope, Sangeeta, that the lessons of of our approach to this pandemic can be used as well when the way we approach climate change. We must not leave things too late. We must prepare now. We must pay an insurance premium, if you like, against the, the future ravages of the virus or indeed climate, climate change. And there are three, I think, big broader issues um, that maybe are for discussion another day. The first is public confidence. We must win the public confidence in the efficacy and safety of this vaccine and subsequent vaccines. And that means that the regulatory process must be independent of politics. Uh, it, that is absolutely essential. Secondly, we must address the cost of these vaccines because this, these vaccines must be distributed to all the countries of the world, not just the richer countries of the world. So cost is crucial. And thirdly, of course, logistics. The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine does pose huge logistical issues, even in a country like the UK, where we have a pretty good um, logistics system because of the cold chain requirements. And the same will be true to some extent of the, of the Moderna vaccine as well. But those are three issues that we, we might discuss um, maybe on, on another occasion. So turning then to the impact on the healthcare system, I think if we're honest, if we're all honest, the healthcare systems around the world uh, in Western Europe, the US, and, and in the UK in particular, have all been struggling. Uh, I don't think they, in their current form, um, they are going to be manageable for the future. Uh, we've got waiting times are getting longer. The, the burden of unmet disease, particularly in mental health, is, is growing. The demography of our countries, the people are getting older. Um, the the, the cr number of people with chronic long-term conditions, multiple long-term conditions, growing expectations, and the growing cost, you know, where some 20% of GNP of our wealth is now going into healthcare uh, at a time when life expectancy has plateaued and health inequalities are rising. This is not, this is not a recipe for long-term success and it is not sustainable in my view. There has to be a very fundamental change to, as to how we deliver healthcare. And healthcare will become, I think, more predictive, more preventative, more personalized. Um, I think the consumer will become much more powerful in this mix, that we will move from the grateful patient who 
is pleased to see a doctor to one that is much more demanding, much more information at the, at the fingertips of the consumer. And this revolution, this, this change, uh, will be enabled by digital healthcare and the use of data. And that will be absolutely crucial in the same way that the banking industry and the retail industry have been transformed by digital and by predict and by all the algorithms that feed into that digital sort of data environment. So too will healthcare over the next five years. And in, and in England, in the UK, our delivery mechanism will be what we call the integrated care system, rather like the, um, the ACO system uh, in, in America, but it will be an integrated joined up system. Uh, the current system is too fragmented and too episodic in its approach. So this, this is gonna be a very fundamental change to our healthcare system. So if I could put a little bit of color on that kind of, on that, um, on that forecast. Let's start off with prediction first. Um, many of you will know companies like Centene and Optum in America who have, got, who have used data to manage populations on, on, a risk based, uh, on, on a risk basis. We will see that coming to the UK, I have absolutely uh, no, no doubt. It will enable us to, to focus on people who are more prone to diabetes, for example, with, with weight management programs. And, and it, will, it will guide our screening programs much more accurately. And we are now just beginning to pioneer the use of polygenic risk scores um, in England. We have a, um, a very, a number of interesting companies who are world leaders in polygenic risk scores. And again, that will enable us to predict people's um, health future, enable us to intervene much more quickly. And we've just launched a, a new pro program called our Future Health, which is a cohort of 5 million people who will be monitored, will all have polygenic risk scores and whose health will be monitored over time, which will give us a very important research base um, around prediction. Secondly, on prevention uh, and early diagnostics. And if I could use cancer as, as an example of that, that we in the NHS have just um, announced a collaboration with Grail in America, uh, which is essentially looking at um, sequencing uh, um, uh, circulating tumor DNA at a very much earlier stage. If we can, our, our view is, is that if we can catch cancer, 75% of cancers at stage one and two, uh, rather than at the moment 50%, that could be transformational to our cancer outcomes. The second example I would give is the agreement we've reached recently with Novartis on the use on a, on a major study using Inclisiran, and in the point which is a PSK9 inhibitor for cardio for, for lowering cholesterol to improve cardiovascular disease. That if we can start treating people at a population level, you know, we're talking about millions of people, rather than this focus that pharma have had over the last 20 years on rare disease and orphan diseases. If we can get these lower cost, high volume medicines into our population as a whole, that could have a huge impact on cancer and cardiovascular disease, for example. And another example I would give on prevention, which has come out of this pandemic, is the huge growth in point of care diagnostics both blood-based and saliva-based. Again, this could be transformational. I, I envisage a time when every consumer uh, will have a care record at home on their phone or their watch, which will have at its, at its heart their, their health care record, but will be constantly updated by their behavioral data from the Internet of Things, by sensors, by diagnostics, uh, and by, by behavioral change data that will feed into those algorithms. And then thirdly, personalization. Um, we, in, in the UK, we've had a long history uh, in genomics, right back to the Francis, the Crick and Watson discovery of the structure of DNA in the, in the 50s. Uh, then through, of course, to the huge global project to map the human genome, uh, to the 100,000 genome project in England with Genomics England. Uh, 
And we are going to see, I think, a, a whole new branch of medicine, which I'd call functional genomics, which could be hugely powerful as we go forwards. Um, and pharmacogenomics will obviously play a large part of that. And I and, and staying with the theme of personalization, there was a very interesting um, paper in the New England Journal a few months ago called Facilitated Self-Care. And I think we will see much more care provided by people outside the normal healthcare system. Uh, on the, and, and it will be determined very much by the data that they have about themselves on their, on their phones or, or on their watches. So if we turn to digital, which I think will be the great enabler of this change in, in healthcare, this is everything from robotic surgery and digital operating theatres that I'm sure that Sangeeta you will have in your, your wonderful hospitals in, in India, through to remote monitoring of um, people with sleep problems or with respiratory problems or with uh, glucose, glucose monitoring for type 1 diabetes, a whole range of um, uh, conditions that can be treated better with better outcomes with, with continuous monitoring. Very interesting randomized controlled trial done by AstraZeneca recently showing that continuous monitoring gave, I think, an extra eight months of life on, uh, I think, one of that, on that cancer drug compared to the more conventional sort of periodic follow-up um, at, at hospitals. We'll see remote consultations. We'll have shared care, shared care records. Many digital therapies coming through now, particularly I'm thinking about in mental health, where a lot we're delivering um, IAPS and cognitive behavioral therapy very successfully on a digital basis. And of course, the whole growth of artificial intelligence and the way that we interpret um, many, many parts of radiology, whether it's imaging or pathology, where we can, we can use machines to, to provide the diagnosis. Um, I'm not going to talk too much today about integrated care systems, Sangeeta, because I think I'm running out of time. But just to say that joined up care um, rather than fragmented episodic care is, is very much the way we see the future um, in England. Um, we have to turn traditional health care on its head over the next five years. I think the pandemic has one of the silver linings of the pandemic is that it's a, it has accelerated the process of change, of innovation. Uh, medicine has not been always quick to adopt new innovation, if we're honest. I think healthcare is behind many other industries, but I think the pandemic in, in more ways than one will have given us a big shot in the arm. And I think you will see a tremendous acceleration of change um, over, the next, um, over the next five years. And that change will be mirrored in the pharmaceutical industry, I think as well as um, computer sciences and biology converge to open up possibilities that would have been undreamt of even 12 months or, or two years ago. Sankita, I hope that's given you a, an overview of the way we're looking at things in the UK. I was very struck by your Prime Minister Modi's comment the other day that um, India and the UK working together would be, I think he said, an unbeatable combination. So I look forward as a sister was working with the Apollo group and all the and other, other groups in the pharma and healthcare world in, in India for a better future. Thank you very much. So much. Thank you so much, Lord Pryor. I think the you really set the context. You gave us the framework of the changing needs from aging to non-communicable disease to rising costs and the rising consumerism. And then you juxtapositioned it with solutions solutions about consumers or customers becoming more proactive about their care, point of care testing helping us to treat earlier, pharmaceutical companies rising up to these new challenges at the pace they had done during the pandemic, and then digital from AI to Internet of Medical Things to sensors to interpretation and early warning signals, all this in the framework of prevention, population health, preparedness and ultimately everything about the patient. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pryor. It's been a fascinating conversation. I'm now extremely happy 
uh, to welcome our, our chief guest and uh, you know someone who's so important to the healthcare system, who has driven us, who has uh, managed this critical period, who has given us wise counsel and really brought all the pieces of this tremendous, uh, tremendously complex uh, sector together. Dr. V.K. Paul, member Niti Aayog, and Niti Aayog uh, is, is steering the Health Governance Committee of the Government of India. Uh, Dr. Paul spearheads India's health policy and programs. Uh, his innate interest and his contribution to child and maternal health uh, the bare imprint of his research and his expertise. His passion for education sector, especially postgraduate education, comes across every time we speak. And we are indeed blessed to have had his wisdom at, in this key position at this extremely critical time for the country. Uh, Dr. Paul is uh, the chairman of the govern, uh, governors of the Medical Council of India. He holds a range of other very important responsibilities. Uh, Dr. Paul, Everyone in the audience is waiting to hear from you. Uh, they'd like to hear, you know, the overall government policy because on one hand we're hearing news of vaccine coming, but when will the government authorize? What is the prioritization list? How do you see the time frame? What is the safety factor? And during the COVID pandemic, you told us we have to test, we have to trace, we have to treat, and we upgraded the whole medical system on those three T's. And now it's a matter of trust. Trust that everyone, the most deserving will get it first, but everyone will get a vaccine. Trust that the vaccine is safe. And whichever formulation, whether it's the recombinant or it's the uh, RNA, or it's on a uh, reconfigured on one of the existing vaccine platforms, it's completely new research. Uh, even though the time frame seems to have been short, the vaccine experience of the country and the world is vast and therefore it's safe. So it's trust and then it's together. How will we together deliver this to 1.3 billion people? Dr. V.K. Paul, welcome. Thank you for being with us. We look forward to your address. Over to you, Dr. Paul. A very warm welcome and namaste. Thank you very much, uh, you Dr. Very much. Sangeeta. Uh, respected Lord David Pryor, Distinguished colleagues on the panel, distinguished uh, viewers and participants of uh, the annual convention. Uh, the annual convention of FIKI is special. FIKI itself is special, it is historic, and it is an institution that has done proud to this great nation. And I'm so delighted, so honored that I am present today in, the, uh, on, in very different times and to share a perspective on issues that are concerning each one of our lives globally, not just in the country. Uh, <clears throat> I, you asked me lots of questions, so, so let me go around that and I change uh, the way I planned. So Sangeeta, that's between us as friends. Okay, that's now first and foremost, as Lord Pryor said, that the whole notion of innovation, whole notion of uh, new solutions changed in this one year, you know, in a in a unprecedented way, in a historic way, we we have learned how to do big conferences virtually. We have learned that meetings can be held in different in in conjoined rooms, but through another medium and so on. And also here, I think we are very proud that uh, India's uh, science and technology enterprise, as well as the the industry, vaccine industry in particular, that enterprise rose to the occasion. Biomedical devices industry rose to the occasion. I want to place on record the fact how so quickly almost 100 diagnostic tests in a matter of weeks, indigenous ones, came up on the scene and we overshot our local requirements, are in our position to send them abroad. And most of them, or many of them, are, are absolutely competitive. And some of them, are game changers like the Feluda uh, CRISPR, te CRISPR technology based rapid diagnostic test, for example, is. Uh, we were producing zero PPE and now we are producing more than half a million per day. That's far above what we need. We were hardly making any ventilators and today we can make more than 50,000 ventilators a year and we are looking for the market where to take them. So we changed, we adapted. 
and our story of covid 19 pandemic control and response also was a graded proactive iterative science driven epidemiology driven approach and we think as a nation we did well uh, we caught a very precious time during the lockdown to prepare our capacities both on the testing and the science and technology front but also in facilities and prepare the nation and we pushed the pandemic slowly on to another trajectory and also lowered the peak from this high to this high and i think we are still reaping the benefits of that momentous decision at a very important time the mathematical modeling tells us that the timing was very critical four weeks later and perhaps the you know the gains would have been half and we would have breached our capacities today is not the time to go in that direction because of the agenda that you have set and i will therefore like to return to two facets that i wish to share with you first on the vaccine and second on the priorities which we should not forget and that's post covid era but i would say that the the present and the future for which we have a shared responsibility and fikki you have to lead us you have to help us you have to guide us you have to resource us so first on the vaccine i am seeing in front in front of me pioneers we have pankaj ji we have krishna and we have colleagues uh, gagan and sridhar so it's uh, i am to give a update on where we are with regard to vaccines i will not do a full job but let me say the following that truly proud of the fact that our vaccine industry and our r&d organizations and government as a whole worked hand in hand from very very early in the course of uh, of the of the pandemic as early as march itself if not earlier than that we were working together the prime minister set up a vaccine task force which was science for science and research with focus on vaccines and other solutions and that created an interface with the industry and with the academia and laboratories and global systems which kept us abreast and created a mechanism where we were facilitating each other's interest this was by the way chaired by dr vijay raghavan and myself vijay raghavan sir is the principal scientific advisor so it provided that connect and it also provided an opportunity how to use the available resources from the government and therefore the dbt created a way to help uh, companies help uh, research started to develop uh, sites for research and they were successful in garnering 900 crore worth of covid suraksha program which is uh, more than a you know something like 120 million dollar equivalent and that's an injection that's not the budget normal budget this is an additional budget and we still we have enough of it to be spent so the point that i'm making is that the whole whole of governments the passion the feeling resources the sentiment sharing this became the way we started to work together and i hope my colleagues uh, that were going to speak again would echo this having said that we see the results today we see the results we see the results in the form of what the industry has achieved which i'll touch in a moment but also what the laboratories have achieved i do know that there are even today at least 5 to 6 to 7 candidate vaccine in our in vaccines in our research laboratories in different stages we tried they tried and some of them will eventually be perhaps a part of the second wave and as i said some of our laboratories are who accredited laboratories for covid 19 research assays vaccine related assays uh, and so on and so forth but i think what who the industry rose to the occasion phenomenally and the result here is a summary today in the world there are about 33 odd vaccines which are in clinical trial phase reasonably advanced clinical trial phase of them about 10 are in phase 2 phase 3 or phase 3 advanced phase 2 advanced phase 3 you know as a continuum and we are proud to say that we have three vaccines in that stage out of these 10 globally and we have three more now which have phase 1 phase 2 trial trial clearances and let me now name them so we have bharat biotech icmr vaccine in phase 3 we have cadelazidus this these are all indigenous indigenous indian indigenous cadelazidus 
DNA platform, an unheard of uh, platform till a few months ago. Uh, phase two completed, waiting for phase three to be invoked. And now we have Genova in phase one, phase two, using the mRNA platform, indigenously developed DBT supported mRNA platform. We are so proud. These three are in one category. At the same time, we have Serum Institute building on the Oxford research, working closely with AstraZeneca and conduct, has conducted much of the phase three trial, waiting for emergency authorization. The, the paperwork is happening as of now, and we do know something very special about Serum is the huge phenomenal capacity to produce, unmatched capacity. And that is hope. If this succeeds, not only our requirements, but also a very important chunk of global requirements would be met. So a special word for Serum's track record and the, the capacity and the leading role that they have. And then we have Dr. Reddy's, which is uh, uh, conducting phase two, phase three trials of the, of the Sputnik 5 vaccine. We are so proud that this Indo-Russian uh, friendship and collaboration uh, materialized, and we are happy that they would like this to be manufactured here and also to be tested on Indian population. And this work is happening as we speak. And above all, and last of all, we also have Biological E and uh, having a vaccine candidate from MIT, which is RBD protein based, which is in phase one, phase two. So six, six vaccines uh, in, in our country. I mean, that's a landmark. That's the Apollo 11 moment for Indian science and Indian industry. I, I salute everybody who is part of this journey. Having said that, in more, more specific terms, more specific, three candidates, we have three applications today for emergency use authorization on sound principles. So we have Pfizer, we have uh, Bharat, and we have Serum. Again, phenomenal. And uh, they have not only met the deadline, they have uh, overtaken the deadline. I mean, they were, we, we would have thought that they, this would have happened six weeks later. No. So it's a very fascinating time in the history today, Sangeeta, as you complete your term, it's an inflection point for something which is so important, so major. And the decisions will roll out in a matter of days, we know it. We know that the decision and importantly, and that brings me to the second bit of what I want to emphasize. And these decisions will be science-based, evidence-based, rules-based, norms-based. Our regulator will do the right decision. You talked about safety, Sangeeta ji. Indeed, safety, immunogenicity and efficacy will drive the decision making. We have absolutely no pressure on the regulator to, to, to do the decision one way or the other. I can say this with authority. We have insulated that system. We respect their own decisions and decision making process. And for a very selfish reason as a nation, it's a reputation to be kept. Our vaccines go to more than half the world. If we compromise in today's situation with any of these, we will be hurting our cause. We'll be very selfish here. So there is no question. The scientific rigor, the evidence rigor, all the aspects will be taken into account. And none of our, the companies, who, some of who are here, would even dream of even expecting anything less than the highest standards to be kept in mind when the decisions are made. So very proud and we have a reputation of our drugs control. I want to also emphasize something which we should spread the word about. DCGI is not an individual or two officers or an office. The decisions are made by a group of scientists, basic scientists, clinicians, epidemiologists, researchers, data people sitting together. So it's about India's scientific you know, uh, capital represented in that room on that day. And therefore, we are very proud that they will do the right decision. We want the decisions tomorrow, if not yesterday. But we will wait till all the parameters are met. I also would like to say that our regulator is also in touch with, in particular, the UK regulator on, a, on, a, on formal channels. And we are trying to work together in respect of a particular vaccine, which is common to, common to both the nations. Having said that about the preparations, two, three points. One, that we, you know, there is a phase in the history of this vaccine where when the vaccine supplies are from zero are now picking up. Right. At some point in the history, very soon, perhaps, it'll reach a point where there'll be plenty as much as you need. 
freedom. Anybody can buy, anybody can take, but it will take time for that to happen. And during this phase of rise, less vaccine potentially compared to who potential candidates are. And in any case, that also is very, very dynamic. So this is the mismatch that leads us to the next decision globally in the WHO, in all the countries, and UK has done it very well. We have to prioritize. Everybody cannot get the vaccine. It has to be quote unquote regulated, quote unquote targeted, so that the most needy get the vaccine. And then there is a general consensus, and that brings us to the, the groups that we decided should be the priority group. First and foremost, look after those who have an excessive and excess risk of mortality. Target to them. Second goal, our connected goal is protect the health system and your, your pandemic response system. This cannot be allowed to, to collapse because we still have 80% people predisposed to the virus. Virus will come back. It likes to come back as it is doing now and like to come back again and again. We cannot allow the shield of health system and frontline system to be weak for fear of the virus. So this goes together to me. Mortality consideration and protecting the system. Then comes the next priority, which means allow livelihoods, allow, allow economy, allow social activities to be as near as possible. And the third layer at some point would be, can we extinguish the pandemic using the vaccine? Can we do that? By the way, on principle, we don't even know whether these vaccines can do that or not. But assuming that they can, it would then be creating enough of the so-called herd immunity, partly with natural infection and partly and hugely, I hope, with vaccines so that the virus then finds no place to go. And we say thank you and we, we, we go, go with business. But these are the three layers of three stages broadly into which our endeavors will go. Linked to this is the amount of supplies that we have. If you have all the supplies in the world, we pick up all the objectives. Till such time that we don't have, then we work with the first one, we would eventually then go to the second and then go on. So in the first category, a simple decision was taken. We looked at the mortality data from across the country and we find that of all the deaths that took place, this work was done by my colleagues and they showed us that of all the deaths that took place, 80% of them occurred in people who were above the age of 50. So we ask a simple question. These are 26, 260 million people, 26 crore people. Can we immunize them in the first go? And we thought, given the, the might of our vaccine industry, even when we apportion part of it for global use, we can, the numbers started to match. And I know Pankaji is smiling because I asked him these questions on the phone before I put the numbers out. So we thought we can do it. So that became our first priority. The other element of epidemiology tells us that those who die also have comorbidities. The third element of epidemiology says 70% of those comorbidities occur in these very more than 50 years people. So 70% comorbidity and 70% overall morbidity take mortality taken care of by this age cutoff, which is easy to implement rather than three forms to be full, fulfilled. What it leaves is comorbidities below the age of 50 years. So we included that as part B of, the, of this priority. Those below 50, but having comorbidities will also be entitled. And we thought this number could be about 10 million. And we thought above 50 is 26 crore or 260 million. To this, we added frontline workers, 20 million and 10 million healthcare workers. And that's our 300 million, which we believe is a priority for us to do as a, as a group. If we have enough vaccine for them, we start all together. If the vaccine is coming in stages, we begin with healthcare worker and then add the other two groups in waves. That's the thinking behind our prioritization. And we looked at UK document, we looked at WHO, we looked at CDC and others. Coming to the preparations very briefly, I would say that cold chain has been built up, conventional cold chain has been uh, built up. Uh, we have spare capacities already. Syringes and needles built up. Uh, we have um, uh, vaccinators uh, being lined up, partly from the government system, but we don't want to load the government system because if you, we depend totally on the government system, our other priorities, particularly primary health care, particularly immunization would suffer. Antenatal checks would suffer. Home-based newborn care will suffer. 
and therefore additional elements are being brought and that's the guidance we given to the state and we told them how to do it we also have built a very strong uh, it platform called covin w i n for win uh, which will be doing the logistics management management link to the temperature loggers but also give the messages for appointment we'll also issue a qr code based certificate will also tell us where you have to go and which day you have to go almost ready testing done and we also believe that once ready we will offer it to the world for any country who would like to adopt this and we'll help them to adopt and adapt this as a global public good so that is ready so in terms of readiness we also have got the structures right down to the block and yesterday we sent our operational guideline which says how a particular booth level immunization work has to be done what gives us confidence is not only the experience of universal immunization program where you would have more than 9 million sessions each year and where 650 million doses are given to children and women every every year but also we have experience of conducting elections in a finite number of days all the adult voters in a very systematic way in homes and mohallas and villages and uh, you know all places go through an election process something like uh, 900 million okay 90 crore they exercise that right on a periodic basis we believe we will use those principles to impart immunization to the priority people and beyond using that methodology i would just say that overall preparations in a way are fine and today somebody very important the dcgi tells me it looks like that you know our preparations are are ahead of the licensure and i said that's how it should be so when the licensure comes in a matter of days i assure you we will be in a position to move very readily we we look forward to that moment to happen and i think this is the way we will go very briefly what are my asks beyond this and that's fiki now the smiles will go because we still have a huge agenda unmet me a huge agenda huge work to be done and there one responsibility collectively is to raise the contribution public sector contribution of investment to 2.5% of the gdp which is not royal but which is perhaps good enough for meeting our core needs and giving a great health people of india i want you to know that the two third of the health spending public spending on health comes from the state government so fiki please can you persuade the state government as well as us to put more on the table through our budgets 8% of state budget should go at least at least that much should go for health doesn't happen we are at about 4.5% of typical budget in a state so working with states to get the investment right is important and perhaps they will listen to it better we can give a try to this my second priority is human resources which is a very obvious one we made huge effort in the last 6 years to to make the medical colleges one and a half times undergraduate seats one and a half times 80% increase in post graduate seats and so on there are almost over 100 medical colleges in the making uh, in, in in various places today from the government side and more in the private sector however we only have 20% of typical specialty specialists of what we need 20% we have a 5x deficit and here i want to request you and sangeeta ji you know my my pleading from this one you have five well the private sector has 500000 beds you generate 9000 post graduate seats only the remaining 7000 beds generate at least today about 45000 or 42000 that's when we are working at today's today level of energy both should increase but look at the asymmetry each one of your beds is a teaching bed working through the national board of examination system small hospital medium hospital you are not optimizing the training opportunities for doctors and specialists please do so and likewise do so for nursing that's my plea and let's work on that and find a way my third take is that huge infrastructure deficit has to be corrected and our national health policy looks at doubling the beds from 1 to 2 per 1000 
by 2025. Can we start working in that direction? I don't see progress in the last three years, two, year, two to three years on this one. Something is missing. Can we, can we, can we please find how to go about doing it? Much of this investment has to come from the private sector. And I'm happy to state here that the priority sector lending from guidelines from RBI are now including up to 100 million rupees instead of 50 billion rupees. That is something which small gain I did through my advocacy with your help. We need to do more in this direction and can we put our heads together? How can we multiply, infra? how can we double the number of beds? What is it you would like the government to do it, which is feasible? And my fourth ask, that's the second last one, is tell us which institutions we need. David, I hope you're hearing. From this pandemic, let's understand what are the institutional things that are missing. Do we have an optimum disease control system? Can we reinvent it? That's an obvious one to say today. But do we have a setup for great health systems research? I'm not sure. Do we have great data system and institution that can handle data? Huge databases and so on. The more data will come through all that digital digitalization that would happen. Are there other institutions that are missing in our system? They may be private, they may be public, they may be a combination. Can we think about it? Because insti strong institutions represent nations with strong health systems. And my last one is a more proximate one. Can we work together with your organization on the mental health issues right away? Why? Because of the obvious need. The need is obvious. But also why? Because Currently, our public health system is so much, so much, you know, stressed because of other priorities. We are making effort in our own way. And there also most many tools are not being optimally used. How much are we doing for mental health even when we can? Because the tools are not there. We don't have optimum number of psychiatrists to guide. We don't have the academic depth of, you know, in, in, in mental health, is health that can, or critical mass of this. Can we work together? Because Niti would be particularly happy to work with the, 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 the private and the NGO sector uh, to create uh, you know, an enabling uh, 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 services network, remote, otherwise working with not only clinicians, but also counselors and so on in this need of our. And we can start working on this from tomorrow. Thank you very much, Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. That was comprehensive, insightful, and uh, clearly a roadmap for the future. I think uh, multiple takeaways. I'm not going to respond to all of them because we have just 21 minutes left uh, and a fantastic panel waiting to speak. I will just say that each one of your points have been noted. Many of them are work in progress. But one minute before we um, hand over to the panel, as you know, Dr. Uh, V.K. Paul is also chairman of the National Expert Group on the Vaccine Ad Administration for COVID. And uh, at the request and based on uh, Fiki's work, Fiki and EY together have put together a paper, Protecting India, Public-Private Partnership in Vaccinating in COVID, uh, because we knew that it's not just the production of the vaccine, which is hugely critical, but it's also the administration. So what is the role that private sector will play? That is encapsulated in this report. Uh, Dr. Paul, we take it that you have symbolically launched this uh, virtually, and we will share these uh, with everybody, because a significant portion of the private sector says they are ready to play the frontline role in partnering with the government in ensuring that we uh, vaccinate the whole country. So your yes. beautiful analogy of in the beginning, there will be more demand and less supply. Afterwards, there will be more supply and the demand will kind of plateau out. And finally, we'll have more supply and less demand. So going through those three phases, private sector is your partner. And we've heard everything else that you said. We look forward to working with you. With this, let me quickly hand over to Tamanna and to our outstanding panel. Uh, and with a very special heartfelt thanks to uh, Dr. V.K. Paul for this outstanding address and with our complete commitment of a total wholehearted participation in everything that you do, uh, we are reassured, we are confident, and we are partners. Thank you. Namaste. Samanna, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Reddy and Piki for this uh, opportunity to speak to what I would describe as the A-team 
of India's ambition to produce an indigenous COVID-19 vaccine. At this point, it would be safe to say that the most pertinent question in every person, in every Indian's mind is simply vaccine ka baiga. We have been through a year that has thrown up challenges, fear, sometimes misery, losses, and now hope. The fact that we are talking about a vaccine for COVID-19 within the same calendar year when most of us first heard about the disease is just astounding. And it is a testimony to what we can do when corporate India, scientists and governments actually come together for a unified purpose. As we close in on the year 2020, India is no longer asking if we will get the vaccine. The question is, by when? And the gentlemen I'm about to speak to are, in a sense, an architect of that hope. So I'm pleased to invite to this discussion uh, Dr. Krishna Ella, CMD of Bharat Biotech, uh, Pankaj Bhai Patel, Chairman of Kerala Healthcare, Gagandeep Singh, Country President of AstraZeneca, and of course, Dr. Habib Horakiwala, Chairman of Work Hard Limited. Um, great to speak with all of you. Uh, Dr. Ella, let me begin by just simply getting your sense on where we are with Covaxin. We know that there has been um, an application for emergency use with the authorities. More data has been asked for. What details can you share at this point of what was the data that was required? By when will that be given? Uh, and what is the status of phase three trials? Um, thank you, Tamana. I mean, we have, the, we have recruited almost uh, 8,000 people and out of 22,000 people. And I think all these last 15 days, we've done recruitment. It's a phenomenal uh, uh, success. And I'm really grateful to a lot of volunteers who are really volunteering because this is the first efficacy trial in the developing world. India has not done an efficacy trial. So whatever others have done is a more of immunogenicity. And uh, so I think we, we are moving now and then uh, Pakaj Bhai will be moving on efficacy trial. So I think this is the first efficacy trial of this country in COVID, even including developing world. Even if you look at developing world, we are the first one. It's a challenging task. And, uh, and I'm really grateful to the government. Honestly, I'm telling you uh, what uh, Dr. Vinod Paul spoke. It's uh, really today, although we started the program only in May, but you see caught up so fast. And we have done 2,000 people in the phase one and two, 8,000 completed in the phase three. And we have extremely good, uh, uh, you know, the efficacy data in the monkeys and hamsters, both the data. So we have both upper and lower lung infection totally cleared in both monkeys and hamsters. So we have extremely good preclinical data and we have extremely good uh, data on the safety profile. And one thing I'm saying, co-vaccine, uh, it's inactivated vaccine, a 35 years old technology and proven technology. It can be given to uh, my six months baby also. It can be given to 65 years also can be given. And the safety profile will be extremely good. And I think we are happy about that vaccine. And I think we have filed an emergency license, but it left to the government to review all those things. And uh, whatever, we, are, we are giving whatever the data they want. So in every angle, we have done actually, but we have done everything according to international standards, not Indian uh, standards. We have done everything international standards. Thank you, Tamara. Over. Dr. Ella, if I just may ask you one quick follow-up. I know the phase three trials have begun on November 17th, and your vaccine is a two-dose vaccine with a 28-day gap. So, of course, we're still waiting for second dose. So, these um, requests for emergency use have been based on phase two results? Yeah, we can ask uh, both uh, phase one and two, and also the preclinical efficacy data on monkeys. is also give a clear indication that monkey data is so, so good and uh, phase one, two, also we have done 2,000 people, not a small number. And that also safety and immunogenicity is proven. And also we are seeing the immune response of the AstraZeneca. We are seeing immune response of uh, Pfizer, where they stand on the immune responses. So we do have some uh, micro-neutralization assays, uh, parameters and correlations. It's not, uh, you know, dumbly, I mean, without any evidence, we are not jumping in it. So we have multiple evidences to prove that it has got uh, similarities. And we know the peer-reviewed uh, publication, publication of uh, uh, both Oxford and as well as the, uh, the Pfizer, where the endpoints are. So we are looking at those things also very seriously. It's not something we're jumping on. And look at China. China has given an emergency license. 
Russia has given emergency license on phase one itself, phase one two itself. So nothing wrong in this. But I think, uh, and it's a whole technology, platform proven technology. I'm not yes. jumping into mRNA or something new generation vaccine. It's a proven technology. So it's something not uh, new to the field. Absolutely. Uh, Pankaj Bhai, what can you tell us about Zykov Day? Have we started on phase three yet? Uh, you have said earlier that by quarter one of 2021, perhaps we can see the rollout. What can you update us with? Sir? So talking about our phase two uh, trial has been completed. Currently, the analysis is going on. We expect to complete the analysis very soon and submit the data to move into phase three. Uh, I cannot give you exact date because that would depend on the data analysis and also on the, uh, the regulator giving approval to start the phase three. As far as the vaccine is concerned, phase two has uh, shown the vaccine to be very safe. Uh, we have done the study for a period of almost nine, three months uh, on almost 1,000 volunteers to find out the data, and we have seen uh, no safety signals, which could be concerned. And also, we have seen a very promising animal data, as my dear friend Krishna was, was telling. We also did the primate study, and we found very encouraging result in primate study. So I think the real point I'm trying to say here is that we are all there to happen. What we are offering is a vaccine we believe can be also given for people who got COVID once. Because this vaccine can be given a number of times to a number of people. And we also see that this vaccine is a very stable vaccine and it may not require a very cold temperature even to do it degree. We've seen the vaccine to be stable up to three months at even 30 degrees centigrade. The most important part is that the platform which we have used is a DNA vaccine platform. And there we see clearly that if tomorrow, and hopefully not, the vaccine, the virus will mutate, we should be able to come out with a generation in a very, very short period, maybe four weeks. And that's the way we have an advantage over that. Amanna, I would like to add here, we would need to continue working on vaccines. My dear friend Krishna, I did not mention, but he's already working on a nasal vaccine. Because I think the we will need much more, as we know, because everything is evolving. Today, we have some limited data on vaccines across the world, which could be two months, three months, four months of data. But I think over a period, we will know which vaccine will have a long-term efficacy, which could ultimately do it. So Krishna, my dear friend Krishna is doing a vaccine on uh, nasal vaccine. We as a company are doing a measles vaccine, which is currently now gone into technical testing. This is a measles based factor virus vaccine. We're using a known uh, standard uh, Zagreb strain in which we have uh, created this vaccine. And that could also help us to also get a vaccine which could be equally safe as uh, because it is being already tested and used for a number of years across the world. So I think, I believe. India has a great capability of creating this innovation. And I'm thankful to the, everybody in the government who have been supporting us like anything to make this happen, including Dr. Paul and, and all the people at DCGI, at DBT, at ICMR, and everywhere. More importantly, the time, this has told us that India can do things. We need to create this environment forever. The innovation environment which we have created today, we have to make it permanent. And to make sure that on a continuous basis, India will continue to innovate. We have benefited a lot for what was done in West. Time is to repay our debt. Time is to also do work where we can offer to the world something which the world is looking forward. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Patel, is there any uh, plan anytime soon to also apply for an emergency use for Zykov D? Anything you can share with us on that, on uh, where you are moving, or will you wait for phase three? We will like to complete the phase three before we apply for the emergency authorization. However, if the global policy changes or Indian policy changes, that based on the early data, they would like to consider doing that, we would be happy to apply. Okay. Uh, Mr. Singh, I'm going to ask you a, a question which actually is for all vaccine makers, but specifically from the point of view of AstraZeneca, because it seems like it could be the front runner to what uh, India will get first and India will approve first. 
how do we make sure that people feel this is a safe and solid process? And I'm talking about lay people because we all know that the misinformation, the WhatsApp messages, all of that has started. People don't fully understand the process. So in the case of the AstraZeneca vaccine, for example, when we get information that um, one, one kind of dosage actually has produced a higher efficacy where there was a half dosage first and then a full dosage. And that wasn't really planned, but it so happened and give us a 90% plus efficacy. How do you then dispel concerns of lay people that the process is truly robust? Because it's difficult for people to understand how something like that would happen. Sure. Uh, thank you at the outset uh, for inviting uh, me over um, and, and also to the esteemed uh, panelist. Um, very good afternoon. I think a uh, very ap appropriate uh, time to ask this question, Tamana, I must say, because if you, if you see, we've had our um, you know first uh, peer-reviewed data independently, which was published uh, of our phase three results, which we had announced on 23rd November. Uh, in La uh, Lancet, and you know, the interim analysis was based on data of over eleven and a half thousand volunteers across uh, uh, UK as well as uh, Brazil. Uh, you know, from a phase three perspective, and of course, we know our partners SII have been Serum Institute have been conducting uh, trial in India as well. Uh, we also noticed, uh, you know, the vaccine is not only effective but it demonstrating protection against severe disease and hospitalization is uh, pretty safe as well as uh, well to tolerated. So I think from that standpoint, uh, very clearly you've got the probably the first vaccine with a peer-reviewed um, uh, information which is available. Uh, in terms of your specific question around different dose, um, you yeah. know, while, while it was serendipity uh, and uh, was unplanned, but has given an intriguing results and all steps were discussed with the regulator before anyone was vaccinated, and we agreed to change the unplanned half dose to full dose, and which has uh, given these uh, fascinating results. So all I can assure is that it's been absolutely transparent process uh, that has been followed and regulated. Uh, been followed. Uh, uh, publication through a peer reviewed uh, in in a peer reviewed journal as well. Um, uh, Mr. Singh, uh, uh, Mr. Poonawala has been quoted as saying that the vaccine could be available as early as Jan in India if the permissions come through. What are the kind of steps you think will have to move forward to ensure a smooth rollout and the right kind of production? What are the kind of challenges you see? Sure, very good question. I think uh, Dr. Paul did touch upon uh, very, very specific that we are such an enormous country. But I'll just like to kind of dial back and talk about what our journey has been. We started working in April uh, with the Oxford University and uh, currently we are hoping to get uh, emergency use authorization, uh, you know, uh, and approved. And that can uh, potentially mean that we could have something which will be available as early as uh, first half of 2021. Uh, but meaningful in the current pandemic, it has to be made broad, you know, available broadly, equitably, as well as timely. And that's what Dr. Paul also touched upon it. And, uh, you know, keeping that in mind, we've signed up close to about 3 billion doses supply agreements across the world. And uh, what we're hoping is uh, to cover close to about 160 countries uh, with these supplies. On top of that, uh, Tamanna, I think due to the viral vector platform, which is used to produce our vaccine, it can be manufactured on a relatively large scale. And we're fortunate mm -hmm. to partner with Serum, which has one of the largest capacity. And more importantly, this vaccine can be stored, transported, and handled at refrigeration, refrigerated conditions, which we are all very comfortable handling, with, which is between two to eight degrees, and meaning that it can be administered pretty rapidly across the country. So I think that's what uh, we're hoping to do, uh, depending on when we get the approval from the authorities in India.
Dr. Khuraki Wala, uh, I, I know that you have uh, offered the Aurangabad facility to the government, to vaccine makers, to ramp up production. Is there anything, sir, that you can update us on if any of those conversations have moved forward? And how do you see uh, private industry really playing a big role when it comes to the tough work of actually vaccinating such a large number of people? Uh, I think there are, there are two issues we have raised fundamentally and uh, we have discussed with the government. I think government today rightly focused on the vaccine developers and uh, once the vaccine developed the question of uh, production would come and I believe in the Indian context the existing vaccine manufacturers have enough capacity uh, for pill finish or vaccine manufacturing. So there is no perceivable gap uh, mm. there. But I think in, this also offers an opportunity for India because India has always been a large supplier of vaccine. And the, the worldwide, uh, what is contracted today with uh, AstraZeneca and others is something around five to six billion doses. And if world population has to be vaccinated, vaccinated, there is an enormous gap. And that gap, India can not necessarily completely fulfill, but has a great opportunity available. For example, you know, like we have offered our facility to UK government. And it, they have started already manufacturing Oxford vaccine uh, since last week. And we should be supplying them in the next few weeks. So UK government is getting ready once the emergency approval is there, it will be used in the UK. Probably in India, it may come more or less in the same time frame. The other aspect uh, which we are looking at, I think we should look at that any research work and what I rightly said earlier, that there, uh, the one is never sure of what, to what extent each of these vaccines will be effective, only time will tell. Uh, we are making assumptions there. And therefore, from uh, India's perspective, uh, what is happening worldwide is there is a large number of vaccine developers. And India should take this opportunity to, because there is going to be a limitation of capacity for manufacturing large quantity of vaccine when there is a pandemic. And that is where India can play a role. And that is where we have created an opportunity for VUCA that we both have vaccine as well as pill finish capacity. And we are in discussion with a number of companies who would like to manufacture their product for emerging markets. Any details you would like to share on those, Dr. Kharakiwala, or is it just too early? On any of these companies? I think it is premature. I would say it is early or late. It is a premature and we can share as and when something gets finalized. You know, there is there is one question I, I actually want to ask all of our panelists, and I'll start with Dr. Ella. On how does one deal with the adverse impact stories which keep popping up? And I I I believe that of course over the last few months all of us have been uh, reading and understanding much more about the science of developing vaccines than we ever have. I think common people know more about it than they ever have. But if you can explain that to us, Dr. Ella, when these adverse um, you know, incidents take place, do you think that there is a necessity for more transparency to try and address that completely and immediately on why it happened? Was it unrelated to the vaccination? Did the person have a previous comorbidity? Were they in a placebo or any such situation? Right now, it seems sometimes there's a fog swirling over what exactly happened. And then that doesn't leave too much confidence. You asked a very appropriate question. Some of the media people will be waiting with a tweeter to immediately tweet uh, what I say. <laughs> so uh, I'll say a very simple thing. Two things I want to point out very clear. Number one, um, any, we are not inhuman people. We are very sensitive to the volunteers who are given their life to us for our clinical trial. We are more sensitive than the press or media people. 
honestly i'm telling every small reaction we are so sensitive we don't sleep in the night time even a smallest reaction we can really become very nervous breakdown for us nobody understands that they think you know we are not transparent we are 200% transparent but we have protecting the volunteers has to be protected we can't disclose the volunteers name we cannot disclose anything but what is important transparency here is do i inform to the regulatory people or not do i inform to drug safety monitoring board dsmb do i report to ethical committee of the institute do i report to the drug control department that's a very important yes we do that all these things but media wants who somebody gets a fever the media oh this so and so fellow got a fever please announce it in the transparent in the newspaper that's not the way the clinical trial is done there's a confidentiality can i have a income tax of yours to be disclosed not possible there is a property of the data something is has to be protected media should ask simple question i have 150 people are working in bsl3 containment facility let media person one person to work in the my bsl3 containment for one month one month i'll surrender my head to that so we are concerned to the every volunteer who is contributing to the clinical research of this country okay so i think the media people should be educated first and i think they should need more education than all of us and i think they should understand in a bsl3 containment facility my people giving a life and working in a bsl3 containment with a live virus working with a fire dilators fermenter live virus that they are not concerned about it somebody gets a vaccine he gets a pneumonia in less than 10 day one week is it a blame for vaccine we inform somebody gets a vaccine and he should be protected covid within one week does it happen we say clearly after second dose 15 days after second dose is what the protection level starts clear they don't even read that english language in a ctd document in a clinical trial protocol they don't read that they immediately they want everything sensationalized i think they are hurting the startup companies innovation of this country by doing like that they are becoming negative i don't know why they are negative i don't know why they are negative at home itself also if they are negative at home that's what they are translating in this matter they should be truthfully look at it in a angle that we are truthful i'm telling honestly we are more truthful than any other countries in the world honestly i'm telling all indian manufacturers we are we know the media is so strong in this country we are more sensitive about that and we are more tra- 200% transparent we are not hiding anything any of us are not hiding anything but that media people are not understanding they want sensation like they want to make a, like a bollywood story now vaccine has become a bollywood story now in this country <laughs> so, thank you tamana tamana can i come in tamana can i come in not all absolutely absolutely dr paul i'm i'm I, just say i will just let's let me say one sentence dr ella i feel what you're saying i'm in no position to speak on behalf of the media but i just want to say i think everyone in this country appreciates what all of you are doing if there was if this was a movie and the villain was the covid-19 vaccine well this is the team of heroes isn't it who's trying to put together a superpower to finish it all so i appreciate yes dr paul please do come in very briefly firstly we should salute our corona warriors that are generating these vaccines but the substantive point has two dimensions one that please appreciate the procedures and the science and the scientific steps and the institutions that are supposed to handle that by that this what i mean is that if such an event takes place as krishna ji said this is reported to the ethics committee this is reported to the dcgi it is reported to the dsmb and they take a call these are independent people the people are not individual they are a group of people with all dimensions of considerations around please respect them and ask them what their call is and we should accept that and likewise when our regulator with all its committees will say safe effective vaccine accept it that we should not take you know foolish questions around it have faith in our own institutions have faith in our own institutions that's the message that should go out to all of us to the media everybody because great institutions make great nations my second part is moderation on some of these issues we are going to have a very strong aefi system when the vaccine is rolled out i overlooked stating that 
adverse effects following immunization is a standard yeah. way of tracking in tracking side effect we'll do that and the companies will also do post marketing survey surveillance as a part of their responsibility so there are two tracks where these things will be monitored tracked and responded to and please that's what we should ensure that these procedures are adhered to sops are adhered to there should be no place for misinformation fake news and rumors please please media i request you that you please create a code of conduct so that we don't allow this to harm the larger public health cause and the yeah. public uh, you know public goodness call the public welfare cause thank you so much uh, dr paul you're absolutely right and uh, because i've got an opportunity if i can just ask you one question uh, now for example when the subject expert committee um, decided that they wanted more data so the official release or the official information that all of us got was simply that there was more data that was required do you think that this could be a test case to understand what kind of data by when so there is an idea of what is going on and i fully appreciate your point about the fear of um, disinformation and unfortunately it is not the media it is now a situation where anyone can spread fake news but yes that is what sir if you can just answer this point about the process well remember our fight against the virus globally is ultimately is going to be win by science disease control yes. surveillance is epidemiological science clinical management is science 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 so allow and vaccine discovery and drug discovery is science so please respect the scientific temper and the scientific you know enterprise and the capital of the nation and of the world and i think there is too much of you know jabbing to to the scientists having said that you are absolutely right that you have a right to ask how the decision was taken but i think it was no time was given on that day you know this suddenly the so i agree with you that there has to be a dialogue and please remember every week we have a dialogue with the with the nation through our press conferences earlier it was every day let's use the channel in addition to other channels i respect what you said you want to know a little more what is the meaning of this data is it death data or is it immunogenicity data the two have a different connotation right that's okay i think i accept that dialogue should be there but please some day we must make sure that the scientific institutions what they are saying believe in them because then we move forward the buck has to stop mm -hmm. some because we as scientists will take responsibility for the truth thank you so much uh pankaj bhai i would like your uh, view on this uh, very interesting debate we are having right now the message that is going out to the public uh, efficacy transparency and safety so i think you may be on mute sir yeah so the many are very interesting questions that i think my colleagues have said you got but i want to take you to the beginning of this meeting where uh, lord david prayer said public confidence is going to be very important if we want to win against this virus how do you build public confidence it's through strong science and strong communication and correct communication and that's why it is going to be very important that all of us whether it's fun pharmaceutical manufacturer or a vaccine manufacturer or healthcare professional or anybody in the walks of life including media everybody has to take a responsibility to give confidence to people because if tomorrow you are unable to generate confidence then how are you going to take care of this disease so i think that is going to be very important so of course if there are problems it's a job of us and you all of us to bring to the notice of the people but before understanding that fully breaking news does not make sense but it will definitely make sense a well thought of well discussed thing it will make sense and i think that is what we need to do it so i think as i would say it's going to be very important that we all work together as a team to generate public confidence and that will ensure that we will win over this disease absolutely with we've run out of time That's fantastically said pankaj bhai we're completely out of time and trust transparency trust that the process is going right that we have the best scientists and the best regulators and the best you know overall scientists in government monitoring this it's trust 
and it's together and we will win this battle. Let's move to the concluding remarks of this session. Uh, I want to thank our panelists so much. It's been a tremendous conversation. Thank you all very, very much. May we please have the concluding remarks? Tamanna, over to you to call for the concluding. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Dr. Reddy. And uh, I think this is uh, a part of the movement towards creating more trust with uh, the kind of uh, candid answers that we've seen today and uh, top scientists and companies working together. As we conclude, I would like to um, you know, hand it over to Dr. Pratap C. Reddy, the founder and chairman of Apollo Hospitals, who's often also called the architect of um, modern Indian healthcare. He's talking about healthcare in the post-COVID world. Namaste. My greetings to all the great speakers from across the world who have contributed for good health to all. It has been a brilliant day, a coming together of brilliant minds deliberating to build an India that will inspire the world to follow its lead. COVID-19 has been an unparalleled medical crisis a kind that I have never witnessed in my six decades career as doctor. Its impact is no less than a world that yet glorious nation has been standing strong, has harnessed, treated the crisis as an opportunity to reinvent itself and emerge stronger and resilient, truly Atmanibar. More than anything else, COVID-19 has been the toughest test of leadership. Our dynamic leader, Honorable Prime Minister, led the battle from the front. He inspired India to believe that we will conquer the adversary, and we did. Our mortality rate due to the pandemic is amongst the lowest in the world, and this is a phenomenal success. COVID-19 has given us a rare window of opportunity to reflect and reimagine our healthcare systems and leverage public and private sector capacities in true spirit of one nation, one healthcare system. In the early 70s, I came back to India and the tragic loss of a young man who needed surgery and had to go to Houston for surgery because such surgeries were not available in India. And he died, you know why? He couldn't raise $50,000. This is what made me think if Indian doctors, Indian scientists, Indian engineers are par excellence in overseas, why can't we build healthcare in our country? This reform has truly made a great change and several private players have gathered together. Today, Indian healthcare system is used by 70% of our population and in all respect, our clinical outcomes are better than the best centers anywhere in the world, which I am very happy that I could bring this reform. We are honored and privileged that the states and central government at present work with us in a consultative manner and speaking for the sector, willing and keen to do more. Industry bodies like uh, FIKI, who is celebrating their 90th annual convention, they have been a strong voice for business and also health sector. Corporate India is grateful to them. Our Prime Minister has reassured the people of India that we will not have to wait for the COVID-19 vaccine for too long and the states and the central governments are developing a vaccine strategy. Now, as a doctor, I think about the future, the most important thing that comes to my mind. We have been born as early as 10 years ago, that the world will face with uh, a great crisis called the NCDs, non-communicable diseases, which will affect 90% of the deaths will be from NCDs, and the cost burden for the world will be $30 trillion, and for India it's going to be $3.8 trillion. $3.8 trillion is almost 50% of the GDP. So, and more, than money. It is the young people in India, the heart attacks, the strokes come and anger people. Who are these younger people? They are the breadwinners. So it is going to be a great sorrow for the family, a loss for the corporates and nations. I, I feel all our attentions now will, should be on this 
and this is where Apollo concentrated on bringing the three additionals. One is artificial intelligence, automation and robotics to make healthcare to face this crisis. But real problem rests with the people. People should realize that they should know the state of their health. So the preventive care is the most important aspect for this decade. Health as an individual and a collective responsibility. And I would add that a career in healthcare is very satisfying. In addition to cutting edge medicine, there is an opportunity to harness technology to bridge the gaps of distance technology and strengthen the care continuum and also detect the onset of disease early on. Leadership and encouragement of our Honorable Prime Minister had helped India to strengthen its position as the preferred destination for medical tourism. Now, in the post-COVID era, India can heal the world as patients from more than 120 countries come to us for care standards because of our clinical outcomes are better than the best centers anywhere in the world. The cost is a fraction compared to the Western world and we deliver care with compassion. We need to prioritize NCD screening and management by increasing surveillance and measures and digital interventions which will be greatly facilitated by the recently launched National Digital Mission, a major step in the evolution of India's digital healthcare. We have also done what is called 24 into 7 Apollo, which has already answered over 20 million patients when they had their queries on whether they have COVID or not, and all other medical problems, supplying, doing diagnostics, and then attaching them to the pharmacies to deliver their medicines. Finally, we stride ahead to add new momentum to our economy. Let's be cognizant that our youthful population and India's democracy is one of the greatest strengths that we have. I commend our Indian scientists and the Indian pharmaceutical industry for making India a forerunner in the vaccine race and make us feel proud. I'm extremely proud of all of them and look forward to more research and partnership.